Thank you to Steve Swain for that forward. Before we begin, I would just like to um, recognize the members of the Performance Committee um, who uh, we all work together to invite uh, Richard to present, and Julius Eastman. I'd like to thank uh, David Schneider, Robert uh, Kendrick, Ivan Rakoff, and Gwyneth Bravo. It was wonderful to see the quality of the applications that came in this year. And I'm just thrilled to be sitting here virtually with Richard Valetudo speaking about Julius Eastman. Richard, as you've, you've read his bio, you all know he's a tremendously accomplished performer. I've had the pleasure of seeing him play and I've had the wonderful pleasure of playing with Richard a number of years ago before the dark ages of the American Academy in Rome. And it's great to see the wonderful scholarly work he is doing on Julius Eastman, who is a figure obviously too long neglected and about whom we continue you know, to learn really uh, fantastic details about his life and his work. Um, so I'd like to get the conversation started um, with Richard. And Richard, I just want to start by talking at the beginning of um, your lecture, you talked a bit about um, Julius Eastman's recordings um, that are available of him both as a composer and a composer performer and an improviser. And you know, for this work for which there is not really an established performance practice, perhaps you could speak to how those recordings have influenced uh, your work as a performer. Yeah, absolutely. And, and thanks, Marilyn. Um, it's good to see you again. Uh, yeah, so I, I didn't dwell too much on those um, in the paper because obviously the, the focus was on um, these repertoires uh, that had scores and a lot of those recordings were either uh, performances of his own music that the score is lost um, or there's quite a lot of improvisation involved or even um, in the one case of the Zurich concert, a fully improvised uh, concert as well as his, his vocal performance. Um, as an improviser, uh, which most people know from um, the Prelude to the Holy Presence of Joan d'Arc, um, which was on the Unjust Plays recording, but there there came out on that um, podcast, well, originally a radio interview that was released as a podcast interview by David Garland. Um, after the interview that I played some clips from in my talk, um, there's a full performance of a, a vocal solo, uh, which was very much a thing that he was doing for years. Um, and in a way, it seemed like he kind of transitioned from being like, sort of quasi free jazz pianist to a sort of uh, spiritual oratorical solo vocal performer. And I, I guess what I got from listening to Eastman's music and one of the big questions that keeps coming up for me and, and I sort of hinted at in this paper is um, has to do with, with genre and style. And um, in, in the early, you know, early Julius Eastman re-reception, we might call it, uh, with the release of those recordings and and as people got to know his name more, um, a, a few people have remarked on this that he's consistently attached to this moniker um, minimalism. And um, it can be useful in some respects. Um, but I, you know, as with any kind of naming process, whether it's like style, genre, or what have you, um, whether it's coming from an outsider or from the composer themself, um, there are these like evocations of a sort of a entrained uh, approach to the musical utterance, right? So with Eastman's music, you know, specifically for a piece like Piano 2, I was really struck by, um, you know, the score has a lot of information, but obviously there's a lot of information missing. And, um, and you know, we can listen to Joseph Kubera play it and hear what he has to say about it, but uh, we're not quite sure what to do with it. And and a large part of that, I think, has to do with how it falls between these cracks of what we might associate with the piece in terms of genre or style. So listening to, um, for example, the Zurich concert, um, just just the naming of it, which was, I'm, I'm certain was kind of applied after the fact. I think he was just playing a concert in Zurich. But but that is clearly, you know, kind of evoking the, you know, the Keith Jarrett tradition, um, uh, which, you know, the, the Cologne concert had just come out a, a couple years before he did that. Um, and the the styles that he covers in that performance are, are really broad. Um, he is doing things that Mary Jane Leach has compared to, like, Webern, um, but also McCoy Tyner. Um, and he's, he's doing a thing which we have these uh, various pieces of evidence that he did a lot, which was 
using his voice as part of the performance in a very uh, declamatory way, either singing or speaking. Um, so you kind of have this sort of melodrama element. Um, and then there's also these these bits and pieces where it seems like he's drawing on just this vast repertoire of traditions and works that he had experienced up to that point as an interpreter of scores, but also as a collaborator with um, folks such as Meredith Monk and Arthur Russell. Um, you know, I mean, really crisscrossing the downtown scene at the time and kind of channeling that into a single piano performance. So, um, you know, like I said, I didn't, I didn't really get into it in the talk, but, um, or that, that you watched, but the, um, just listening to that recording and hearing how as a pianist, you know, and, and as pianists who play a lot and at a certain point you, you start associating like a physical, physical gesture with something that you're experiencing purely acousmatically. Um, I, I noticed there, there, he was bringing like what we would call like a, a different keyboard styling um, to essentially what we could conceive of as the same piece. Um, and even though Piano 2 is definitely structured in this way that presents it as the sonata and, um, you know, there's, there's clearly these like motivic elements that run through it and these episodes that kind of wander around, um, there are certain uh, features of it like, for example, all of these uh, perfect fifths, whether they're part of, of kind of chordal structures or in the end, in the final movement, there's this kind of really riveting, virtuosic and maddeningly, maddeningly hard to practice and perform finale with um, just parallel fifths um, like crazy. And, you know, it could be easy to see that and just see these rows and rows of 16th notes and to kind of think like, oh, it's um, it's kind of austere, you know, austere modernism, um, you know, really prioritizing like the the metric nature of it and keeping all those notes on the grid. Um, but then I listen to what he's doing on the Zurich concert um, or in some of his some of his other performances of other people's music with a kind of similarly abstract aesthetic, and it's it's got this like rhetorical weight to it. Um, so kind of always trying to find the right rhetorical tone for what I think could help, you know, you know as, help the music pop off the page, as it were, uh, rather than trying to, um, you know, play, oh, well, I'm reminded of that, that, uh, something, uh, in, in the kind of early music debates, right, of, of presenting a, an aural version of the score. Um, and, and actually Matthew Mendez in his chapter on Eastman in the, in the book Gay Gorilla alludes to this, like this problem, um, with Eastman reception and performance practice, where a lot of the questions we're having to face are very similar to the, the early music movement, um, as it was and is now. Um, so I think thankfully, you know, like using these recordings of him playing, even if it's not a notated piece of music, um, at all, it, it definitely brings a lot of ideas. Um, it really, as an interpreter, kind of helps spur on that creative thinking. It was, it's kind of interesting to me because, you know, Eastman cast such a wide net, right? I mean, he had this tremendous familiarity with so many different kinds of music. And so we have this, you know, this very um, broad scope of his own interests and fascinations. And yet, you know, the sort of odd assortment of his own pieces and his own recordings you know so it's like we have too much sometimes and too little right there's so right. many there's so many indications of things that he was well versed in and fascinated with but then how do we apply that to our own performances I was wondering if you could because I'm just curious myself you're mentioning that before leaving the country shortly you have been combing through the archives in Buffalo and the Eastman finding these old recordings of Eastman as even an ensemble player. Maybe you could um, talk a little bit maybe more about some of these interesting finds and things that you've discovered um, that sort of document these different aspects of Eastman as a performer as well as a composer. Yeah, d definitely. Um, yeah, it's interesting because I, I had been in conversations with um, the University of Buffalo Library and, and about visiting those archives several months before the pandemic. Um, and then of course, I didn't make that trip um, until a few weeks ago, which was 
a little too late to really incorporate anything into this paper in terms of like what my experience of those works were. But, um, you know, this, this paper in part, uh, lecture recital, but you know, it ended up being kind of a long document, uh, will, will kind of turn into a chapter of my dissertation, which is on, on Eastman. And, um, so listen, you know, listening to those recordings, uh, thankfully I don't feel like I, uh, you know, got ahead of myself and then listened to some things and I was like, oh, I was completely wrong. I might, I might end up changing my mind about that. But one of the things I got from listening through those archival recordings, which really, I mean, it, it just surprised me once again, just in those few short years uh, in Buffalo, how much music he played that we wouldn't necessarily associate him with um, kind of like the point I made in the paper about his affinity for the music of, of Robert Palmer. But I um, mean, he was doing, you know, everything that was uh, considered avant-garde music um, from, you know, Europe and America in the, in the late sixties and seventies um, playing uh, Stockhausen doing, doing uh, text works by Lucier, um, some Bernard Rands with, um, with Takahashi and um, I mean, I, the list goes on and on, but one of the things that always struck me, and, and this is corroborated by a number of, of written accounts, is this kind of immediacy, um, a kind of, uh, like a, a, clearly, a clearly honed pianistic thinking, um, but like an, an approach that prioritizes like the immediacy of gesture um, and like a kind of said earlier, like a sort of emphasis on, um, musical rhetoric, um, even in, even in these kind of like hyper notational, um, works of the, the modern avant-garde or like high modernism. Um, it's really about, it seems like to me, it's really about communicating something for maximal effect. And, um, it gets more complicated. Like, as you said, like he casts this wide net. Um, so in his own works, I, I'm really coming to find, uh, through my study, and this is an idea I'll have to really develop further moving on, but, uh, I, I think at all times he is kind of doing a, a, um, cross reference or, or like a kind of, everything is sort of a parody of something else in a way. <laughs> Um, so we see this in some of the works that are really well known, uh, you know, using quotation in places you wouldn't expect, um, you know, a, a Bach's uh, Ein Festeburg showing up in Gay Gorilla, um, which is kind of an allusion to Debussy's En Blanc et Noir, which Hisama uh, has pointed out, um, Eli Hisama. So it's just like... I love the Mampu reference too. Or the mom I mean, yeah, the Mampu thing was just like uh, an incredible find. And I, unfortunately, like, it seems that he was really into this person and probably was playing a lot of those pieces, which, you know, are, are in, in a larger sense of that kind of pianistic tradition, much less played than many other things. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm really excited about the idea that you know, using Piano 2 as an example, but um, as a way into his other works, um, kind of understanding how it's not, it's never clear cut. I think he's always trying to muddy the waters. Um, actually, I, I see Sumant Gopinath in, in here in attendance. And um, I very recently read and, and briefly cited um, his, his essay in the new book that came out, um, um, just what was it last year or so, but I, I, I really like what uh, Suman's idea is of, of there's, there's all these binaries. And I think, hi, I think uh, Eastman is uh, alongside Suman, I think uh, is like encapsulating both, but also flipping them in a sort of a, an attempt to navigate this like in between space. Um, so like um, Suman's essay was, like Julius Eastman against minimalism, but using the word against in the, the dual, the dual sense as an opposing, but also leaning against or, or being supported by. And I, I think it's a really beautiful, a really beautiful um, formulation and kind of metaphor for how I, 
not only, I don't think he was only doing that with minimalism. I think he was doing it with everything he did. Um, even, you know, you look at like the disco he did with, with Arthur, Arthur Russell, and he's kind of doing these wild operatic things, but then these kind of, uh, you know, very sexual grunting sounds. And then he'll play these kind of roiling clusters on the organ. Um, and that was just like a studio session where they're like, you know, just do something. And he, he gave him a bunch to work with, even though he, he knew it's like, we're making a dance record. Um, so I think, you know, it's always exciting. I clearly, I, I get kind of jazzed up just th talking about it. Cause it's like, there's, there's so many ways to go, but I, I kind of don't feel like we'll ever pinpoint like an answer to a lot of the big questions we might have about very, these things. It's a very dazzling kind of frame of reference and, you know, yeah. read your paper and listening to your performances, you know, I think you, you bring all of that, those references and, you know, it, what we might call postmodern or, or, or in a, in a very um, exuberant way. And I was wondering, maybe I, I didn't, I didn't, ask you this question previously when we were um, preparing for this talk, but you know, you mentioned Shevsky and I, I think that's such an interesting pairing or duo, the two of them, you know, Shevsky, who's also this virtuoso who sort of dabbles elegantly in so many different styles. Um, and yet Shevsky who became sort of this like massive superstar of this. And then you have somebody like um, Eastman who is analogous in some ways, but had, you know, such a different uh, sort of a different character to the way he used his materials. And I'm wondering if you could talk a bit more about the relationship between the two of them or how you see, I'm not sure, you know, you probably, I don't know if you worked with Shevsky as well. Um, no, no, uh, no, you no know, how, you, how you see the, the two of those figures um, as opposed or against or, or, or something. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's a great question because um, it comes up a lot uh, in, you know, people's accounts of, of Eastman, the relationship with Chevsky, um, actually Kodwo Eshwin's uh, essay in that same collection, um, we have delivered ourselves from the tonal, it's called. Um, but Kodwo Eshwin um, kind of opens up his essay saying, the, the closest parallel I hear to this music is that of Frederick Chevsky. Um, and, and yet, like, uh, from everything I've looked at, it's very hard to find much about what their relationship was beyond collegial. Um, there's some accounts of, of Chevsky, you know, definitely commenting very favorably on Eastman's performances of his music, but it was largely as, as the reciter in the, in the piece coming together. Um, so I, I'm not, I'm not quite sure what to make of it. Um, other than, yeah, I, I think they both were experimenting with different approaches to what we would now call postmodernism. Um, but it, it is a little, you know, it, this is one of those places and, and there's many, many facets of studying Eastman where, you know, you, you turn this corner and then you're confronted once again with the fact that it's like, well, what, what was it that enabled Chevsky to go on and have the career he had? And Eastman, who was doing a lot of the similar things, especially when it comes to, um, as I mentioned in the talk, like this kind of marriage of, of a sort of pattern-based minimal minimalism with like highly political content, you know, definitely charged to make a message that was um, topical. And, you know, it's time and time again, you know, the kind of clearest answer is just like, there were systemic injustices um, there were various types of, you know, barred entry to certain establishments and institutions that that Eastman um, encountered. And at the same time, I think Jevsky, as I don't know his work super well, um, I haven't played that much of it, but, um, you know, it's very much, uh, you know, it has been au courant for a while, like it, it appears on programs all the time. And I think in a way, Chevsky kind of did the thing that a lot of composers who are successful do, which is like you kind of figure out something that works and then you just keep doing it, um, which is not, I mean, I think he's very prolific and, and um, I think a lot of that work is, is really amazing and, and powerful and it's definitely spoken to people. But um, at, taken as a whole, 
you don't really get the sense that there's any like outlier pieces, um, anything that's like truly unusual compared to all the other works. And that, and that goes, um, the same with the way he is an, he did, he was an improviser and like what accounts we have, um, you know, many recordings of, of his improvisations and they're all kind of always in that place. And that's where I think Eastman was different. Um, kind of like we were saying before, I think, um, he was so excited about kind of music as this kind of meta meta con concept of, of music being this powerful spiritual force that it's, it's, I think it was for Eastman less about, less about style and less about like what works, um, you know, ca careerist wise. And, um, and just trying things out constantly, like truly being like an experimental musician for his entire life. Um, I think there's, there's, I mean, there, I think there's something definitely to that in the sense, you know, I think there are a lot of parallels between Eastman and Shepsby. I, I kind of tend to agree with you that not to speak, you know, ill of the dead, but I guess they're both dead, um, but, um, but, you know, Shevsky was very much a crowd pleaser. And I think he was a provocateur, but, in a more limited fashion. And I, I think there is that significant angle of Eastman where he he was willing to go a little too far sometimes. And he wasn't, uh, you know, I don't think his first, uh, he wasn't always thinking about accessibility. You know, I think he he was trying to stir the pot up quite a bit. And yeah, I think and possibly that, obviously there were so many factors um, hindering his um, critical reception, but certainly he was, um, yeah, he went, he, he stepped over the line, maybe even for today's audiences. Sometimes we find this music still has this power to shock, whereas Shevsky's music is, you know, very, very um, established, accepted within, you know, regular conservatory system. So even when it's political, it's, it's very yeah. political. <laughs> it's very yeah, and, and speaking of political, it's, it is interesting to note that, um, you know, Shevsky's commitment to being, um, I, I can't remember exactly what, what he called himself and but was a communist or a socialist i mean communist basically um but this kind of attachment of ethos to something that is is atheistic and you know it, by by my understanding like uh if if spirituality or religion comes up in his work it's it's ironic um or even a cynical commentary and with you know with eastman we we have a fair amount of evidence that by basically by like 1981 he was really committed to this kind of very personal brand of 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 maybe we'd call it like a pantheistic spirituality um and at a certain point his works took on this uh, uh almost like a preacherly tone um this really i mean really leaning heavily into a lot of judeo-christian imagery and and ideas but but also um you know reading a lot of confucius and lao tzu and he, he talks about this in his interviews and just like he's he's kind of at a certain point really made a point of like bringing a sort of uh unabashed and honest approach to like being a spiritual person um and and having music that spoke directly through spiritual and even religious practices. And I, I think that is another big difference where, you know, in, especially in, in modern music circles, um, and maybe again, that was another way he was a provocateur. Um, but I, I think it was also something deeper because to a fault, as we understand it, his commitment to that kind of spiritual living um, and, and even asceticism at a certain point, um, not only negatively affected a lot of his relationships, but certainly didn't mesh well with, uh, you know, neoliberal capitalism and making a career as a as a composer. Um, okay. And so, yeah. you know, I want to follow up on a little bit, you know, keeping Shevsky in the discussion and maybe branching out a little to talk about another person who was part of the world of Buffalo, you know, Morton Feldman, 
And, you know, what do you think was in the water <laughs> in, in Buffalo at the time? These, you know, these very different kinds of virtuosity, you know, at this same time in American music, um, so much was changing. Um, can you sp speak a little bit to like maybe Feldman and, and these different forces of, of virtuosity, how you see this having maybe played out now the reception of their music? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I, uh, yeah, the, the Feldman thing um, is, is exciting and also kind of complicated. Um, there was definitely, in, in um, Rene Levine Packer's book about the center, um, This Life of Sounds, um, there, there's a lot of, I mean, she writes a lot and, and quotes a number of people who were at the center then about how pervasive Feldman's influence was, especially on the fellows, the, the composers and performers there. Um, and it was kind of that thing where uh, there's some accounts, like at a certain point, the composer concerts just kind of all sounded like Feldman. I mean, it was just really influential, but I think one of the interesting and exciting things about someone like Feldman at that time is he also was playing all of his music for the most part. Um, or, or not all of it, but but certainly active as a performer of his own music, um, as we saw with like five pianos, um, which Eastman was on. Um, but I think, in terms of like this kind of new new virtuosity, I I think what I find exciting about the connection between Feldman and Eastman, other than what I discussed, which was this kind of way of abstracting um, personal like religion and, and spirituality in, in, a, in an aesthetic. Um, I think what's exciting is this idea of, um, in most cases, using the piano as, as, again, as like a site of rhetorical utterance and, and an emphasis on sonority um, instead of like... Um, the kind of earlier Cajun practices of, of, of chance, right? So, I mean, leaning into intuition, I guess. And so in a way, I guess, I think this idea of like the virtuosity of, of intuition, um, and then the performer's job to convey something that is, is really kind of hard to grasp mentally, um, which like at a certain point with those scores, you know, the big piano solos of Feldman, I've, I've played a few of them a few times. You've played a lot of them many times, but I, I still feel like I don't, I don't embark on playing the piece and have a sense of like the full scope. Um, it's, it's almost impossible. It's like, you know, even if you know a city really well, you know, you enter, you get back to the city. Um, and now, especially like, I don't think a lot of us would be able to navigate most cities that we know really well without Google maps or something. Um, or like, you know, you can you can talk about. I mean, I lived in Los Angeles for a long time. You can talk about LA, but it's like, there's, you know, a number of square miles of LA that I've never even stepped foot in, um, you know. And that's a separate discussion, I guess. But just, I feel like I know LA. I can navigate it, but um, I, I kind of feel that way about about his pieces, where it's it's a it's a virtuosity of of the experience and the commitment to the music. And so I think that that has a lot of bearing on Eason's music. And I think, especially when he got into the, the longer duration pieces um, in the late seventies and, and like, you know, around the turn of the eighties, um, using certain very, I mean, extremely clever compositional techniques that um, conceptually are so streamlined um, like the idea of just, we're going to use stopwatches, but everything you're doing has a beat to it, or it like has a pulse. Um, and all of the transitions are organic, you know, to use his word. So the music sounds um, kind of like it's constantly evolving, but there's these very clear landmarks for the performers to keep track of while continually re-upping that commitment to the performance. So I, I, I think... That's one of, of many, I mean, we could talk about this a lot, I guess, but that's one, one of many things that I really see carrying over, um, where you, 
the score is a map. It, it's it's simultaneously prescriptive and um, inspirational, I guess. I think that's a great way to put it. I think absolutely. You know, as you were talking, I was um, maybe thinking to other um, figures you discuss in your presentation and play, people like Robert Palmer or Anne Silsby, who are much you know, lesser known to, to many of us, although I, I recounted before the talk that I actually did meet Anne Silsby when I was in grad school. I had just no idea <laughs> who she was and, and, and what, how remarkable her experience had been. Um, but I mean, what, what, what do you find, you know, as a musicologist, you know, what is challenging about trying to document and uncover these relationships or the, the, the evolution of the repertoire in the sort of recent history that right? we're looking back maybe 50 years or something and what do you what do you see in your own work as the you know, biggest challenges i think i i i this is such a good question i i feel like there's a getting lot of up in the morning you know, yeah. Like yeah yeah <laughs> and there's like a lot of people in attendance who are like oh God, I'm, I'm, we can't see you but i you know i'm sure everyone's like we have things to say too but okay, um, please comment. I would ask that people to put their comments in the chat. Yeah. I think in this case, like for this particular project, what is simultaneously like very exciting, but also challenging is the fact that um, so much of the archive is still in a state of discovery, um, which is largely because it was so spotty and minimal to begin with that um, these things come, you know, like this book, we have delivered ourselves from the tonal. It just came out last year and I, I finally got my hands on the library copy and it's like all these great ideas about Eastman's music. And some of these things are connected to like what would amount to kind of major, major musicological discoveries or um, sharings. And so it's, again, yeah, it's simultaneously very exciting um, and really challenging. And, and then the case of Palmer and Silsby, like, Thankfully, being here in Ithaca, uh, where their um, papers are kept, and a lot of that documentation appeared in my talk, um, it's it's exciting to know that like I have that archive, but you know there's no there's no book on either of them, um, and you know I'm I'm really thankful for like Adam Tendler's work in recording the complete music of Palmer and and really kind of committing to that project of kind of making making his music more well known um and i really hope the same for silsby i'm i'm you know kind of keeping track of all her music that i want to play and you know i i think it i think it should be out there because alongside eastman the fact that he was so dedicated to these composers um yeah again here's a point of frustration like i i really don't know what the texture of their relationship was we know that Anne and and Julius were friends, but we don't know anything about Robert Palmer in terms of like, I don't even know if he met Eastman. Um, he must have, but there's just no account of it. I've, I've gone through all his letters, um, at least the ones that exist. So, you know, it's that, that perpetual problem, problem of the archive, um, whether it is robust or um, severely lacking. Um, that's a big part of it. Um, and yeah, just like, you know, for music, especially like Anne Silsby's music, as I looked at more and more of the scores that there's just no recordings of these, um, including the, the two pieces that she wrote for Julius Eastman. Um, I, there's not only not a recording of those performances that I know of yet, uh, maybe one will come up, but no one's recorded the piece at all. And they seem pretty great. Um, but also like. I think there's it, it offers opportunities for other types of getting to know people. Um, like, as I mentioned, Anne Silsby committed herself to poetry for, you know, many decades. And I've read all her poems. Um, they're really wonderful. Um, it, you know, it's maybe in some respects, like, not necessarily um, enlightening in terms of like, the exact nature of the, her relationship with Julius Eastman and like, you know, when they hung out and what they like to eat. But, you know, it's, it's, that's where I, why I'm really excited about like the way the field is going now is, um, this kind of, you know, opening up the avenues for a kind of interdisciplinary 
look not only in terms of um, various um, scholarly practices, but a, a kind of interdisciplinarity or, or, or intertextuality that you can bring to the, the creative practice of these composers themselves. So, you know, it's, I guess, if there was a lot of stuff out there that gave me a lot of information about Anne Silsby and Julie Eastman and the nature of their relationship, I might not have read all of her poems. But because that was missing, I, I experienced all this great poetry by um, someone who lived in Ithaca, you know, my current hometown for, for many years and was a beloved person in the community, um, not only musically, but otherwise, so. Um, I'm encouraging people, just keeping an eye on our, our clock to put questions they might have. Ah, okay. Um, I see oh. a comment. Thank you, a long one. <laughs> so um, let me see. Uh, oh, my goodness. I wonder if That's we... great. Yeah, I... I uh, um, if everyone can see that, I, I suppose I don't need to well, read it. Is, it is possible, I think, um, for maybe Luis to allow Sumant, maybe if you wouldn't mind, just so we could hear your voice asking what looks like a really <laughs> interesting second. question. Possible to... Yeah. Oh, yeah. So now uh, you, you should have... be able to talk now. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, so nice to meet you both. I'm I'm uh, just so happy to participate and wanted to say thank you both for your amazing work. And I'm um, I just wanted to I won't read all of that, but I, I'm sorry I just got excited. But I was just wondering about I mean the the gist of it is in piano two and in some of the other late um, Eastman work if you want to call it late. I mean I know those temporalities and those demarcators are problematic. There's the way you described and the way that others have described it as I've read, and I, I should say I'm still like learning about Eastman. I mean, it's a relatively new, you know, kind of uh, engagement for me. But it seems like the way that his work develops in the in in this in the 80s is often discussed in terms of spiritualism and kind of the the furthest removed from the professional interests. You know, I mean, there's the Tompkins Square Park period and homelessness and, you know, and all sorts of things that are hard to document or aren't well known. And I'm, I guess I'm just wondering, aspects of the style of Piano 2 also seem like they recall mid-century modernism in various ways. And I'm just curious. And there are other aspects of some of the late work I'm thinking of that also make me think of you know, earlier musics and what I've read of, I haven't heard it, but of, of the second symphony is also like, seems like that has elements of this. Um, and I'm just wondering, what do you make of the return idea like, or like revisit his past? Like there's this reflective kind of rumination on who he was, like what made him. Anyway, this is me now rambling, but I'm just, um, I'm just curious what you make of that take on it as opposed or in combination with maybe the kind of spiritual mystic, you know, kind of oracular, take of, of what's happening in, in Lady Smith. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks, Simon. Um, yeah, I I think what I would make of it is, is similar to what I, I think you're alluding to. Um, I hadn't really thought about the notion of, of a return to a personal past. So thank you for highlighting that. Um, I guess um, from everything I've read and, and just my understanding of, of kind of what is shared about his approach to spirituality in the 80s. Um, it seems so um, kind of forward looking, um, um, even though like in terms of his understanding of like his own place in the, the you know, long, long history of com composing music, um, he definitely was interested in uh, you know, a looking backward sense, but I, yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't really considered it in terms of like reconnecting, you know, in his case, like with his personal like roots in, in like ecclesiastical practices. Um, but I, I guess knowing, knowing the score, I'm um, never having heard a performance of the, of the piece, our father. Um, and then hearing, uh, which was, you know, from the same time as piano two and then hearing his, performance from that same year at um, BAM, uh, which was on the Next Wave Festival. Um, it's actually on, on Vimeo, on, on Melissa Finley's, who is the choreographer. Um, hearing his performance of this piece, One God, um, I guess I, it's interesting to note that like, yeah, at that 
what what seems by all accounts to be a really bleak time for him um personally or, or at least unstable um he's still like playing on stage at bam and the first half of the program was music by philip glass um and he made a choice to present this um again like as you're pointing out with this piece um like something that is very much like a mid-century modernism um in terms of his harmonic choices and the kinds of like asymmetrical phrases and stuff but using it to support a vocal line that is you know a kind of stentorian uh, dramatic declamatory profession of 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 the one god to him um so i i'm i'm not sure what to make it it's, it's a really good question it's definitely gonna give me something to chew on for a while um but i don't know just like glancing back at the box this last bit here um reading your rate reading your phrase um the late work as the furthest retreat from professionalism um i yeah i mean it, that can't be the whole story obviously um as as you're i think you're pointing out so um i hope i hope that answers your question i'm, I'm yeah again like i said i i think there's a lot to to go on um with many aspects of of studying eastman and his music and you're kind of always confronted with a like but could that be it <laughs> you know like this seems so compelling and yet um so i'm gonna yeah i'm gonna have to think about that thank you um let's see if we have any more questions i have one maybe last one if uh if there's no one else in the comments you know um richard i guess you know the sort of like at the end say you know, if there's you know one thing you would uh, want to want to say in particular but one thing i'd be curious about obviously diversity debates and the um that becoming such a priority you know in concert programming and academic circles you know eastman has become this really you know, held up often, you know, since all the stuff in Philadelphia with Bowerbird and putting forth these recordings, you know, and so he's become this, you know, sort of great symbol of trying to open up the canon. And, you know, how do you feel about his reception um, and how he is being seen? Uh, do you feel he's being, I don't say exploited, you know, I mean, I, there's this idea about for what reasons are people interested in Eastman. Uh, obviously there's so many different ways people come to his work, but I just would, I was just wondering how you feel with these kind of, you know, the commentaries now on diversity and the need for diversifying what, what's on stage and what's being taught. You know, how do you feel about the way Eastman is being positioned sometimes? It's, yeah, it's a big question. Um, give it like a three word answer <laughs> if you want. I mean, it's a, it's a uh, hairy- I'll but, say a few more words. Cause I, yeah, yeah no, I mean, I, I do. He's a, he's a hot wire. I think it's a, it's a live wire, yeah. Yeah, I think it's a complex situation, um, largely because, um, you know, there's there are all these issues with the idea of the canon and what it means to be included in the canon, um, whether, you know, post facto or or just, you know, as assumed as necessary. Um, I. I'm thinking a lot about Alejandro Madrid's article on on the canon, especially in um, in academic settings and what what it means to construct a canon and what it means to like, quote unquote, bring diversity to a canon. And I don't I don't want to say I don't want to get too much in the weeds with that um, in terms of like the way Madrid discusses it. But I think with my own experience of Eastman and one of the things I was trying to get at, perhaps very obliquely with focusing on piano two is um you know there if you google eastman there are loads and loads of videos of about four or five of the same pieces and you know thankfully we have scores to a bunch of others and those are not the ones getting performed and you know it's it's not a matter of like calling anyone out or saying like this is insufficient in this regard but i i think it's interesting that the pieces that get performed the most are the ones that occupy a lot of space on the program, um, usually have the incendiary titles. But, uh, you know, more important than both of those, to me in the whole picture is like, they're pretty easy to put together. Um, they don't require the amount of work that say, putting together a massive 30 or 40 minute piece by Stockhausen might be. And I that kind of 
that doesn't i haven't really seen that talked about very much but it, it does kind of weird me out um like there was a joke going on new music circles in in la for a while where like if you were a new music group and you you only had two pieces and you needed to feel <laughs> yeah exactly or, or the symphony you needed to fill another 20 minutes but you know you don't have a lot of rehearsal time you're like oh, let's just play john cage um you know let's just do let's do one of the number pieces and like we got it covered um so i don't think that's exactly what's happening here but it is interesting that you know i i haven't heard recordings of of i think there's one recording of our father and um it's doing a different thing you know we've kind of already talked about how it, it's this very prominent spiritual element as opposed to being like about identity politics, even though that could be construed as a different type of identity politics. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's complicated. I, I'm, I'm so glad that his music is performed all the time. I mean, I was just coming to learn about it right before the big rush. Um, you know, I think a lot of people say 2018 is the, the year of East Mania. But like, um, I, I have mixed feelings, I guess, to put it very, there's your, the, the four word answer, I have mixed feelings. Okay, um, so we have another comment here, um, and I I appreciate uh, um, uh, Ellie. Nice to see you. All right. Nice hey, to see you. There, really, really helpful. Um, and I I see we have to sort of wrap things up, but I think that was really great to hear you say to articulate that point of view, Richard, as a performer and musicologist who's really trying to flesh out Eastman. So we're really appreciating him, and you know, in all his fullest, right, <laughs> in, in in all the ways that his work is rich and nuanced and yeah I, I i agree with you that sometimes it's easy to play certain pieces but of course he's a much more complex figure and his work is much more uh, problematic and much more compelling so i uh, very much appreciate your sharing your uh your thoughts uh and explicating your processes with us i think we're out of time all right we actually have like a they said they gave us like a 10 minute extra yes. Oh, oh, we have a uh, grace period of 10 minutes. Oh, I'm grace. so sorry. I'm so sorry. Can, no uh, uh, I certainly don't want to cut. Can we, uh, Ellie, or if anyone has more? I'm so sorry. I did not, did not realize that. Are there more, any more questions? I, I was premature yeah. in praising you, Richard. I apologize. No, no, no. no. <laughs> no. Um, no yeah, I'm, I'm excited. Uh, yeah, so Ellie was just asking about how there are these dates, um, which are his birth and death dates. And yeah, I, I also thought it was curious. From what I understand, um, the provenance of that particular score is, um, and this is, I, in my conversation with Joe Kubera, he he told me that there is at least two or, there were, at that time, there were at least two or three copies that Eastman had made. Um, and he thought that Eastman was, um, you know, quote unquote, shopping the piece around um, because there was a, I don't know, I'm, I'm forgetting the name. I, I, I have a written down somewhere, of course, but there's at least one other pianist um, in New York City who um, Kubera and David Borden know that had a copy of it, um, which might have actually, I think that was the one that ended up being the one scanned. So I, um, I think that those um, dates were just either written down by whoever owned it or whoever obtained the score um, on its way to um, you know, showing up in, in, in Vermont and being scanned subsequently. Um, yeah, there's, there's actually a couple of bits, you know, those, those little bits of text. There's the one spot that he, he just writes, it's very small, but he, there's this little grace note shake on like a ninth and he, he writes grace notes, like really tiny. Um, but it's, sometimes I'm not sure what his handwriting is. Um, and what might be someone else because from what I've seen of his many scores, I think he intentionally changed the look of his writing. Um, Cause in, in the, the multi piano pieces, a lot of it's like, most of the time it's all caps. And, um, but then you have the, there's the score to the piece fugue number seven, which everything is just basically calligraphic. Um, and even when he writes a little more standard text, it's, it just, it looks totally different. I, I, I just, yeah, it's interesting. I, I think it was just um, an owner of the score. Once they found out he died, just kind of popped it on there. But that's totally just, I'm just 
I'm wondering about that too. Um, I kind of briefly, Marilyn, you, you, what you were saying there at the end, it, it just made me think that the one thing I did want to say about Eastman's reception and, and the way his works are being performed is the one thing I would like to see happening more, which wouldn't really happen with a piece like Piano 2, but is definitely a very compelling possibility with many of the other scores, is like um, m much more idiosyncratic realizations of them. Um, a really early version of that was like the recording of Stay On It by Horse Lords, um, which is basically like a jazz quartet out of, uh, I think, Baltimore. Um, and it's it's a, an amazing reading of the piece, um, but it, you know, it, it's definitely, you know, if you were looking at it kind of in, in, in an impoverished sense, it's like missing elements of, of the original recording. Although, as Matthew Mendez like points out in his chapter, like there kind of is no original version of that piece um, in some respects. But I, I think this kind of leads me to just my point, which is that one of the big problems I see with, you know, for lack of a better word, this like kind of canonization of his work is a lot of, um, and, and it comes from a good place. I don't think anyone's in the wrong here, but a lot of performances are kind of trying to to do what is on that one archival recording that we have of a piece. Or to use, you know, to use even robust scholarship and, and awareness of what's out there to kind of arrive at the definitive version and to kind of, to replicate what we think are Eastman's you know, intentions. And not that we shouldn't try to do his intentions, but, um, you know, as we've been saying all along, like, it's complicated. And I have a hard time. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> yes. Uh, I have a hard time believing that Eastman, I, I, I am led to believe by the way he developed his compositional processes, that yeah, like, as Sumanth is pointing out, I think he was in t trying to avoid Virtua. He was finding ways to make Virtua impossible, Troya, excuse me. Um, and it's, I think one of the best things we can do, and I, I kind of hinted at this at the end of my talk, is um, make, it your, make it your own, so to speak. Like, I, I think dedicate yourself to the music in a way that shows respect for what he did and what his ideas were. But um, I think... Eastman would be delighted to have like some really off the wall realizations and, and not to indict anyone, but I just, I don't see uh, a major symphony orchestra programming a work and then saying like, let's mess this up a bit. Um, so, you know, I'd, I'd like to see more of that. And I, I think, I think the work um, really allows for that and even invites it in a way that, that actually feels very true to the score. Um, in ways that are completely divergent from the Virktoya concept, so. No, no need to preserve this in amber quite yet, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we all know what happens. We all know what happens when you do that. Then you get a park full of dinosaurs, and that's just bad news. That's right. Okay. Thanks. If we have any more, any more comments? You know, I've, I've I've prematurely praised your work, Richard. So I guess I have to do it again, but. Oh. Really wonderful speaking with you to hear your performance always inspiring and um, just really appreciate um, the multi-dimensional take you've given us on Eastman and his inspiration in the world he lived in so thank you thank you so much thank you Marilyn yeah thanks for the great questions and for leading this and and thank you everyone for attending it, it's, it's great to see your names here and hope we can connect in person somewhere down the line absolutely oh, thank you good night all right, enjoy the rest of the conference.